He's on. Well, a very good evening to you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to City Question Time. Can I start by introducing myself to those of you who I don't know? My name is Chris Hayward. I'm the policy chairman of the City of London Corporation, which means I'm the political leader of the corporation. And can I thank you all for making time on a very warm evening, I think we would all agree on that, uh, to come here tonight for this important uh, exchange between our residents and uh, the corporation. And uh, what we want to do is to hopefully give you the opportunity to ask questions on the topics that matter most to you as our residents. And I'm very pleased that Tom Slay, who I asked to chair this uh, particular event, who is the chair of the Barbican Centre Board, will be keeping order and chairing our proceedings today. And Tom, can I say thank you straight away for the fabulous Barbican Centre, which really is a credit to the corporation and to you and your board. I'm also uh, joined this evening by the chairs of a number of the City Corporation's <coughs> grand committees, alongside uh, Commander Uma Khan, who many of you will have met at previous residence meetings, who's here on behalf of the City of London Police. Um, and the various chairs will introduce themselves as they answer with me your questions. And can I also say how pleased I am to see a number of my fellow members uh, and officers uh, in the auditorium tonight. Now, ladies and gentlemen, earlier this year, we held two resident forum meetings. And I said to my officers when I returned to Guildhall that it was very important that we did a feedback, that we recorded what was said and we actually gave answers. And if you haven't had it, I hope you will pick up the copy, I think they're on your seats, of a uh, You Said We Did document that each of you has been given. Now, these leaflets summarise the work we've done based on all the questions you raised at those meetings. Obviously, being a leaflet, we've had to group some of those questions together under the, the same heading, effectively. But it is uh, the work that spans from the private issues to questions about our estates and the Destination City programme. And I am committed, and I remain committed, to producing feedback from each of these residents' gatherings, uh, where we try and record and pick up the things you asked us, which we couldn't answer on the night, but which officers have gone back, and we have told you where we've got to. They won't be necessarily everything you want to hear. They won't necessarily be entirely completed in some cases. But it's important that you know that we did record them, that we are actioning them, and we are going to try and deliver on them to the very best of our ability. Now, since those meetings we held, I'm very proud, personally, of much of the work we've done to support our residents across the City of London, such as the agreement to invest £29 million carrying out repair works to the Golden Lane Estate, an issue that when I became policy chairman, I committed to seeing uh, through, and a year afterwards, we are now committed to doing that. And that is just part of our wider plan that will see <coughs> the City Corporation ultimately investing some £95 million across our estates. And that is part of the resident reset relationship that I am seeking to try to achieve with all our residents in the square mile. And following feedback from those meetings and indeed other correspondence you've had with me and officers, we also took the decision to accept expressions of interest for those with proposals for repurposing the buildings of the London Wall West site, which I know has caused much concern for residents in the Barbican. And whilst I'm happy to answer detailed questions about that process in due course this evening, what I can tell you in general terms is that having received those expressions of interest, the corporation is currently, as you would expect, reviewing those expressions. <clears throat> So I'm here, along with my colleagues tonight, to listen to you and to try our best to answer your questions. So thank you again for making the effort to come this evening. 
So before we hand over to Tom and start taking the questions, I have a, a very important individual here this evening. Well, he's important to me, and I think he's important to the corporation. I think he's important to you as the residents. We have a new chief executive and town clerk, Ian Thomas, <coughs> since we last gathered for one of these residents' meetings. And as head of our paid service of 4,500 staff in the corporation, I think it's appropriate that I invite Ian to say a few words about himself and indeed his vision and that of his officers for the City of London Corporation. So, Ian, can we give you a microphone? And you've got one. Yes, I, I have one, Chairman. Is, can everybody hear that? OK? Yeah. I, I won't uh, take too long, because this is really your time. Um, so thanks to the Chairman and to the panel for affording me just a few minutes uh, for uh, introduction. I've been working for the best part of four decades on improving the lives of local people, local communities, working with communities to secure those aims and, obje and uh, objectives. That cuts across social care, um, health, housing, uh, which is important to many residents here, of course. Um, it includes um, uh, transforming um, uh, places through regeneration uh, uh, amidst many other things as well with regards to uh, community empowerment. Uh, Vision-wise, it's working with the members and with residents on the vision, actually, to ensure that we are the best that we can be. Um, whether that's um, your day-to-day -day life experiences, whether it's about uh, education and job opportunities, uh, whether it's about the public realm, anything that you are concerned about, working with members, I want, I'm interested in and want to prioritize working with you uh, and other wider uh, stakeholders. This is an amazing, amazing place. The corporation is an amazing institution with a huge uh, amount of uh, assets to, to draw on. And I believe that uh, uh, transformation and improvement comes <coughs> through working in collaboration and working together. So again, uh, I'm not gonna take up too much time right now, but happy uh, to take uh, uh, questions or uh, queries from uh, residents uh, at any time uh, afterwards uh, via email or writing in or whatever it is because this is really your time tonight so without further ado chairman if I must if I may hand over back to you because it's their time thank you thank you town clerk chief executive and now I'm going to hand straight over to Tom Slay to chair the rest of the proceedings Tom over to you thank you Chris good evening everyone and can I first of all begin by thanking all of you who are in resident associations those of you who are officers of the various civic and community groups for the time that you put in to helping strengthen our local communities. What you do is incredibly important, it's unpaid and, and it really makes a difference. Um, I'm Tom, I'm the chairman of the Barbican Centre Board. I'm in my fourth year, my final year. Um, and I would just like to reflect for a moment, if, you, if I may, on uh, how we got here. That 40 something years ago, it was our predecessors who made a decision to build, uh, build this place and to put culture at the heart of the renewal of, of a city that still was scarred by the Second World War. Uh, and if you think about the, 40, the four decades that have passed since, uh, and today we have Destination City, which is placing culture at the heart of renewal, this time from the pandemic. And so there's an interesting theme and continuity there, and a sense, I believe, of unity of purpose. Um, this is an incredible place. Uh, when you travel the world, people have heard of the Barbican Centre. Uh, the, the, the content, the, the world-class artistic output is, is famous. Audiences come from across the world to be here. Uh, but it also works very closely with local communities. And, and we're really proud at the Barbican to, to celebrate uh, our local communities and to embrace and showcase uh, the people, the places, and the things they want to talk about. And I think the Barbican has a really good outreach programme. But also, um, I suppose I also wanted to say... It is, it is a place that's showing its age. Um, it happens to be the same age as me, um, so I have some sympathy with that. Um, in fact, this morning I had to sit down to put my socks on, so I think that's a sign of, 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 of an advanced age. And, and that's why I am personally and the Barbican Board are so pleased that the Corporation of London have committed to the Barbican Renewal Project, which is you know, a really ambitious project to renew, not just fix the leaks and plug the gaps and fill the cracks, but it's actually to transform this centre so what people for 40 years have had to enjoy will, will be able to enjoy in a different way in the next 40 years as art forms change and ways people consume content changes. So, you know, just thank you to, to, to Chris for his support of that project. Um, the other thing I would just say is we were a bit late because we got lost, which is not an unusual experience in the Barbican. Uh, it's my view 
one of the things renewal has to fix is wayfinding around the Barbican. Um, it's no longer a kind of a, uh, an amusing joke, I think, to get lost here. It shouldn't be London's greatest escape room. Um, we shouldn't have the strap line, come to the Barbican, you'll never want to leave because you won't find the exit. <laughs> And so we, are, we will hopefully fix that through this wonderful uh, and exciting project. However, this is not about the Barbican Arts Centre unless you want to ask questions about it. This is about you and your questions. And so can I just quickly run through the protocols for tonight? Um, please may I ask you to ask questions and not statements. Um, I think that will allow us to get through more so we can have more voices heard. Please try and be concise, both in your questions and the colleagues in your answers. Um, I'm going to try and kind of group topics, so, so we'll take a few questions on each topic, um, and, and I'll try and do my best to get a sense of how many people want to talk about a particular topic, because there may be, perhaps I have no idea, one or two topics that particularly uh, enliven people more than others. Um, if you could just wait for the microphone, there are two, I think, roving microphones to come to you. When you have it, let us know who you are and which part of the city you're from, because not everyone will be here from the Barbican. Um, and also, if there's a choice between a Barbican or a city resident or, or a common councillor, I'm going to choose a resident to ask the question. I think councillors have got lots of opportunities to ask questions. It doesn't mean they can't ask them, but I'm going to prioritise our residents. You should also know that this is being filmed, not live. It's being filmed and will be produced uh, and put on, I think, on YouTube at a later date. So just be aware of that as well. And so with that in mind, uh, I will ask whoever would like to ask a question to please raise your hand. Sir, there with the white jacket. And you can just wait for the microphone to come. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you, my name's uh, Graham Wallace. I'm a resident of the Barbican. I've been a resident for 40 years. I have served on the RCC and other residential associations relating to the Barbican Estate. My question is regarding London Wall West, and my question is this. What do you, how do you intend to approach the possibility of the London Museum, Museum of London, falling into urban dereliction? For example, when do we expect to see the removal of Museum of London branding and signposting so that people coming to the Barbican from St. Paul's don't get confused and lost in that corner of London Wall. Thank you. Chris? Uh, thank you very much, Tom. Um, look, this is a probably the most controversial <laughs> subject that uh, residents are probably likely to want to discuss this evening, although there are, I know, many concerns and many controversial subjects. One of the things I said at a previous uh, residence meeting is that we would listen as much as we could to the desire locally to retain the buildings at London Wall West, namely the former Museum of London site and Bastion House. And I chose personally to go back from discussions I've had with many of you in this room and actually ask officers to conduct a uh, soft uh, market testing exercise because the professional advice that we have been given quite clearly demonstrates to the corporation that the future of those buildings is past its sell-by date and that we need to redevelop and we need to move forward. But I know that that produces a lot of concern for Barbican residents. So before we move forward with the planning application that we have for a commercial development, I asked officers to invite expressions of interest uh, from anyone, from anyone, there was no constraint on this, as to what might be possible on that site if we didn't uh, pursue that actual uh, planning application. Uh, we have had a number of expressions of interest. They are being analysed at the moment by the officers. Um, many of them, of course, are heavily qualified. They require due diligence, both by the applicants of the site and indeed by the corporation itself but basically whether you want to believe this or not our minds are open we do have a responsibility and i've never shirked or hidden from this to realize a best value for the site but best value incidentally is not just about finance it's not just about finance it's about 
how can we potentially ensure that public benefit and public interest is also considered in that respect. So look, uh, Tom, the jury is out in response to your question. Um, we don't know, frankly, tonight, and you're not going to be able to extract from me tonight because I don't know what we're going to end up doing. But what I have done was in response to concerns expressed by many, many, many residents, and not least the Barbican Court to Action Group, was to ask officers to look at other options as well. We will analyse those and we will report back to you as soon as we're able to do so. Chris, there was, there was a question within the question about yeah. the Museum of London Signs and the kind of what called dereliction of the museum. It, 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 to be clear, what I'm worried about is that corner of, of our <coughs> in community falls into dereliction while yeah. we, we were waiting for you to decide. That's a fair... Yeah, and, sure. and the confusion around... The, the signposting of the, of the Museum of London all, all around the neighbourhood. When are you going to do that? So we've uh, got that question. OK, we can, we can tackle that pretty much immediately. The signposting... Dare I say, I don't think the signposting is particularly great across the city at the moment. I think it's a challenge for us to ensure that public realm across the city, but particularly around the Barbican, which, as Tom said earlier, uh, I find extremely confusing, is not good. We do not want to allow that site to fall into dereliction. Let me absolutely be clear about that. That has never been on our agenda, never our intention. But we do need to signpost people so they understand where to go and what's going on. And I think I can give a commitment tonight uh, to, on behalf of the corporation to say that will be a priority for us to do that. So I hear your call. It was a very specific question. I used the opportunity to perhaps enlarge a little bit further <laughs> on other issues that members uh, that, of the public might want to raise. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Sir, did you question get answered are you happy you very good answer. thank you good um the lady in front of you with the uh scarf it's quite warm weather for a scarf hmm. um it's about london wall west you no yes and so that, actually yes. I, sorry very good point i think we should now try those who've got questions on london wall west yes. let's try and bring them forward now um my name's avril baldwin i'm joint chair of barbican quarter action can i just say how delighted we are that there's been the soft market test and extremely pleased to hear about these expressions of interest. We, um, we congratulate the city on what they're doing. I want to come back to the point that Mr Hayward said about best value, because it is crucial to this, isn't it? And the fact that you said that public benefit and public interest <coughs> will be taken into account. Um, can I assume by that that you're, ref you're, the, the, you're referring to things like your fantastic climate um, change policies, destination <coughs> city to try and open up the city seven days a week, and of course your reset with residents that, you know, the reason we're here tonight. Can, <coughs> can I assume that those uh, factors are part of this definition, definition of best value? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, let me say, you can assume that, that you are correct in assuming that, and thank you for your kind remarks about the fact that we did go out. We didn't block our minds and say, we're doing this, come hell or high water. We went out and we said to the market, and I believe there was some cynicism as to whether we would get expressions of interest, I might add, to do other than demolish, certainly, Bastion House. We have had. And not only are they expressions of interest, they are credible expressions of interest. But I, they are obviously commercially confidential. I can't share them with you tonight. And I can tell you that we have absolutely have a duty, as does, of course, those who have expressed an expression of interest, to do proper due diligence on it. But you can certainly take a commitment from me that it will include those points that you have particularly articulated tonight. Do you have a follow-up, madam? No, that's fine. Very good. Uh, is it on the same topic? Yes. So the, the person at the back, I can't quite see. There we go, you got my microphone. <laughs> I'd like to know... Could you just say your name and where you're Sorry, from? my name's Henrietta Nash. I live in Cloth Fair, which is opposite St Bartholomew the Great. I would like to know how many members of Barbican Quarter there actually are and why they have been allowed to run the agenda when there was a clear commission, a clear uh, view among residents at an earlier meeting that the building should be destroyed and something else built. Why has the matter changed? Because a small minority, as I believe it to be, but I may be wrong, have, are running the show. I mean... I, I think that no one here on the panel is qualified to answer that, unfortunately. Um, I mean, and I don't think it's fair for us to direct the question to another member of the, of the audience, but I think your point has been noted. Thank you. Another question on London Wall West? 
Okay, so we will move on to the next topic. Uh, the lady there. Hi, um, my name is Jane and I'm from Tower Ward. And uh, my question focuses on antisocial behaviour in Tower Ward. And if I can give you a little bit of background. Um, basically, I, I'm well aware of the antisocial behaviour policies that both the corporation and the police have. But me, experientially, they're just not working on the ground. They're just not happening. And um, I think the city is opening up, which is good, but it's opening up in a way that is potentially very damaging <coughs> to us as a small community in Tower. And I suppose my question is, what are you doing now? And what are you going to do moreover in the future to prevent this antisocial behaviour becoming even more of a problem? <coughs> Thank you very much, Jane, for your question. I'm going to pass that to Commander Khan from the City of London Police. Jane, I'm uh, personally really sorry to hear of the uh, problems and issues that you have been experiencing. What I will do on the personal level is I will reach out to you after this meeting to ensure one of our dedicated ward officers uh, speaks to yourself to pick up your matter, um, and I'm also going to make myself available to speak to yourself on that issue. Uh, broadly across the city uh, over the last six to 12 months as part of the refresh of our policing plan to make the city uh, one of the safest districts for people who live, work and visit is that we have, uh, first of all, uh, refreshed our neighbourhood policing. We have appointed dedicated ward officers and I hope that if you're not already engaged with them, then that you will be in the coming days and weeks. Uh, alongside that, we have, uh, as a partnership, refreshed the Safer City Partnership, and only this week I chaired the Safer City Partnership, and one of the dedicated priority areas is the antisocial behaviour as a delivery group, uh, which my chief superintendent for the city, uh, Rob Atkin, will co-chair with the director uh, from the corporation, and we will look to prioritise those hotspot areas and give accountability <coughs> into that space. Uh, I recognise there's other forms of antisocial behaviour which this particular delivery group will pick, but what we want to do is on the ward level, such as the Tower Ward, that we want to make sure that you have that regular engagement with our newly appointed dedicated ward officers so that you get that support that you require and those issues that you are experiencing get addressed. And I'm sorry once again that you've had such a difficult time. I do appreciate your There are policies in place, and I personally use those policies, both in terms of engaging with the Corporation of Corporation Police and the Corporation of London, both at the time that the antisocial behaviour was happening, and I'm principally talking about antisocial behaviour in terms of clubbing. Um, I, I engage at the time, and I also engage in the future in that I go to licensing and planning meetings. And what I really see is that what is being offered is just not working. And I don't want to be uh, as well sport, but I, I really don't feel as if, as it, as it is, the city actually has a handle on the nature of the antisocial behaviour that we in Tower Ward experience. And it is not destination city. It's not people to coming to the city to engage in our wonderful yeah. culture. Sorry, Jane, would you mind just wrapping up? Because I think it's, it's an important point, but we will have a lot of questions to get through. Yeah, I, I will wrap up. Um, these, these people are <coughs> drinking, fighting, keeping machines. They're not decent My people to right. respond to decent rules. And I feel very, very let down. I'm going to pass this question to the Deputy Chairman of the Police Authority Board, Tyce Brooker, who's at the back of the room. Yeah, um, sorry for sitting at the back. Um, uh, but um, really good, um, and thank you for raising the issue, and the issue of, of, of antisocial behaviour. 
Um, this, this is absolutely an, an issue that we uh, as elected members and, and Helen, who is also serving uh, on, on the police authority board, uh, might be able to add something also from a uh, community and children's services perspective. Um, but you are absolutely right. I think the new reset with the dedicated board officers is, is the mechanism of why we can get closer to, to, the, to the communities. However, I think that um, around antisocial behaviour, um, there are things where we just need to get better in responding. And also, when we look at, for example, nighttime economy and things related to that, um, that we need to uh, have the impact uh, of that uh, for, the wider, for the wider community, not just in Tower Ward. So I think uh, there is a real commitment from us as a police authority uh, to pick that up um, using the new ward structure and indeed actually working with um, some of the councillors like Marianne, I know, for example, uh, we've had discussions around this in the past as well, uh, to make sure that we, we, we get as much of that feedback, because sometimes that's, that's a bit hard. But um, uh, anti-social behaviour is one of our key priorities now in our policing plan uh, and in the, in the, um, for us as an authority and, a, and as a force. So, so um, hopefully, when we meet next time, next year, um, you would see some of those benefits in, in real life. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Thank, thank you, Tyson. I'm just going to pass um, to, to kind of conclude this uh, to, to Helen, who's Deputy Chair of Community and Children's Services yeah. Committee. Thank you. Um, first of all, Jane, th thank you very much for raising this. And I do want to assure you that when we hear concerns such as yours, and we do hear them from, from a number of different parts of the city, from a number of different perspectives, we take it very seriously indeed. And I think um, it's very recently, I, I guess, been brought into very sharp uh, focus because um, the frequency with which we have these incidents reported to us is, is increasing. So it's not a simple one to solve. And uh, Commander Khan has given you a response and, and Tice Brook from the Police Authority Board's perspective. But what I wanted to say is that there are a number of arms of the corporation who are really trying to work together to, to solve some of these problems, or at least to try and offer some solutions. And that includes the Safer Safe City Partnership, Community and Children's Services Committee that, that I'm part of, uh, Environmental Health, as well as the police. Now, I would say there aren't easy solutions. However, we will try to work across rather than in individual departments to find some resolution. But perhaps I understand uh, um, um, Commander Khan wants to speak to you at the end. It would be really helpful if you could pass on your phone number and then we can follow up or contact details and we can try and follow up as much as we can. Great. Is that okay, Jane? Fantastic. Okay, now we're kind of on the topic of crime, disorder, policing, antisocial behaviour. Any kind of questions in that general direction? Uh, hang on, you're a sitting member, I mean. Yeah. So I'm going to go to a resident behind you. Gentleman there. Oh, hello. Uh, David Wilcox. Um, um, I know that the Destination City team will be highly focused on Bartholomew Fair because it's coming up very quickly, but anything else about what Destination City will mean to residents during the rest of the year would be very welcome. And in particular, harking back to your point about signage and wayfinding and so forth, there was a good line in the presentation which said... Uh, that they wanted in Destination City to improve wayfinding by increasing awareness uh, that the city is not just individual buildings but a collective of fun fascinating places to see, spend in and work at. And it seems to me that programme is something that residents perhaps could contribute to during the rest of the year and might be a point of engagement. I don't know whether you're yet in a position to say anything about whether that will be carried through. Thank you for the question. I, I'm going to, I think, probably suggest the answer is shared because there were two parts of that around destination city kind of strategy, Chris, and then Shravan, there's a piece there around wayfinding. Yep, yep. Uh, yep, I'll let, uh, I'll let uh, Shravan uh, talk about the wayfinding response, uh, if I may, David. Uh, your comments about uh, Bartholomew Fair, incidentally, are, are, are noted because, you know, we're, we're resurrecting the celebration of Bartholomew Fair as a major cultural uh, opportunity, frankly, for the city, and um, we're putting a lot of work into that now. We're also launching next week, in fact, an absolutely new brand and website for Destination City, which I think you will find pretty dynamic and interesting. Certainly, I've been very I impressed by it. I mean, 
It is important to say that Destination City is not just about a series of events. It's about a transformation of the way we see the square mile. So that whilst the square mile remains, and always will remain, uh, the business city, we open it up to have a more greater vibrancy and a greater opportunity to attract inbound tourism and footfall post pandemic that will spend new money in the city. And so this cultural change, and it is a cultural change, it's much, much more than just a program, is something that will take place over a number of years. But we've had many discussions on this at my policy and resources committee, and we've committed to some of the things that you've talked about, including wayfinding, and that's probably a good moment to introduce Shivan to us the wayfinding. Before you do that, there was a specific point about resident engagement. In yeah, well, let's be absolutely clear. It's fundamental to have resident engagement in Destination City. Politicians uh, at Guildhall, uh, it's not their programme, they don't have all the answers. This is a city programme. So if you feel we're not consulting widely enough on Destination City or the more engagement that residents could have. We want to hear that. We want to know how precisely we do it. You know, so people say all the time to me, Chris, more consultation, more consultation. and they're right, but we need to understand what it is and how we want to do it. But let, if I could take, we take your details, if we may, David, um, uh, the officers will come back to me and we will come back to you and indeed to wider residential community to, to try and explain what we can do to, to greater involve the residents. We want Destination City to be owned by the residents as much as by anybody else. Thank you. Now, Shravan, we got lost on the way in. You're in charge of wayfinding. <laughs> what went wrong? I think, I think I was leading the charge. That's what went wrong. No, um, it, I, I think wayfinding is absolutely one of the critical pillars of achieving Destination City. And one of the things we're trying to do with this policy is attract people into the square mile who may not have experienced it before and, and bring different demographics into the city environment. That absolutely needs proper wayfinding from a very basic level. Um, and we are going to be implementing a series of changes to the street signages uh, to, to direct people through the city, to encourage them to explore different quarters of, of the square mile. Um, you may have seen, if you've wandered around the square mile recently, with the new business improvement districts that we've got now, there are five of them. They have got individuals on the streets. Uh, you'll see them wearing bowler hats. Uh, to actually help guide people, help them out if they're lost, and, and actually encourage them to find uh, and discover new new parts of, of, of the square mile. So that, that's hand in hand with the bids. We're also talking to heritage groups. So we're talking to uh, the Jewish community about forming a Jewish heritage trail. And again, that will be app-based. It'll be using technology as well to help people uh, wayfind through the square mile and discover, discover new bits, which is what Destination City is all about. Thanks, Ravan. And we, we, I, somehow I failed to keep us on the topic of antisocial behaviour and police, and we moved on. <laughs> However, the gentleman there has had his hand up for a long time, so I'm going to take him, but I do recognise, sir, you've got your hand up as well. Ah. Stuart Morgan, being resident of Parliament since 1969. This concerns the safety of both residents and workers, uh, particularly from cyclists. I'd like to know how many cyclists have been prosecuted in the last three years for cycling through red lights or through um, zebra crossings. I'm old enough to remember the zebra crossings. Uh, when people have been on them. I was actually hit by a cyclist a couple of years ago who went through the um, crossing outside the Barbican uh, centre. Uh, they had um, on pavements with motorised vehicles yeah. at speed as well. Which yeah. Is a serious problem with deliveries. But, but Thank you. Just, just, just to finish this off, uh, to uh, the Commander, um, I've seen cyclists riding either side of one of your vehicles mm -hmm. at a traffic light, through the red lights, and no response from your vehicle at all. Now, is this policy that, that you leave them alone? Or are you, can you reassure us that some action will be taken? Because at the moment, it's uh, banded. Country out. Thank you for the question. I'm going to start with the commander on the enforcement side, then I'm going to go to the chairman of planning transportation on the policy side. So, commander. Thank you for the uh, question. I'm sorry about this particular issue. And I, I, say, I share a lot of your sentiments. Uh, it is a significant challenge around inconsiderate cycling that takes place in the city. And uh, 
my commitment uh, as the lead for security and operation is that I'm absolutely committed to ensuring that we do everything that we can do to address these issues. Just to answer your question on the first bit, I have, before coming to this meeting, just looked at some of the data that I was able to access myself, just, just doing some basic search. So we, we did prosecute uh, 49 cyclists in the last year, and we engaged with 259 uh, in, in broader terms. But equally, we also have to look at the City of London Police in terms of uh, the numbers and other issues and challenges that the officers are required to deal with and respond to. And, and, and I can produce loads of different data around what those small team of traffic officers and the response officers that, that they deal with. But that's not what the intention is. The intention is that we are working very closely with the corporation colleagues and I know uh, the chair of the transportation uh, committee will be giving an update on the Vision Zero aspirations. But what I can do is to give you that assurance that I have recently, uh, as part of my focus to increase the intensification in this particular area, as we're doing around the nighttime economy through the Operation Reframe, as we're doing around the phone snatches through the Operation Niven, or Operation Verdita, which produced fantastic results. But it's about prioritization of those resources now to make sure that we also look at inconsiderate cycling. And I'm more than happy to involve you in those conversations to do have a similar response as we have for the nighttime economy, such as the op reframe, where we do invite our partners and stakeholders and residents to come and engage and be part of that response. So I'll, I'll say that much, and I will continue to provide you further updates through the dedicated ward meetings. Thanks, Commander. Thank you. Um, let, me, let me talk about a couple of key policy areas which, which, are, uh, which are really important. In, in the way that our transport strategy is evolving. Um, the first one I'm going to talk about is healthy streets. So healthy streets policy is to encourage active transport. And, and I, I don't think anyone would deny we want to see less motorised vehicles on our streets. We want more active transport. It's good for your health uh, and it encourages uh, uh, well-being. We've seen a 400% increase in cycling since the transport strategy has come into place. Um, and, and that is a phenomenal increase in the number of uh, people using cycles across the square mile. There are bad actors, of course there are, uh, but we've got to remember the majority of people coming through are actually well behaved. We also run training programs for cyclists, uh, and, and I, in fact, the chairman of policy will, will know it. Last week, we just approved the next round of budgeting to continue that training program for cyclists to encourage safer and, and better, more responsible behavior on our streets. The other policy I'd like to talk about is Vision Zero. This is a critical, uh, policy that's been brought in by uh, the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan. Uh, it's about uh, wanting to eliminate uh, deaths and serious injuries on all of our roads. Uh, and we subscribe to this ambition um, and, and have worked quite hard on the reforming of some of our streets ways. Uh, and a good example is where we have one-way traffic uh, on a street, we'll put contra cycling the other. And that encourages uh, less sort of immediate traction between, the, between vehicle types. So. There are things we are doing, absolutely, we want to encourage better behaviour from cyclists, from all users of our roads and streets and walkways, and, and again, work closely with the police on how to enforce that. Thank you. Um, did the questioners have a follow-up on that, or are you OK with the response? I don't response? think you began to address the question about people being on the pavements, travelling at speed with power-assisted cyclists. I have been confronted on a number of occasions, had a leap out of the way recently, and I walk the streets of London regularly. Um, I do live here as well as a resident, but I can tell you it's become a serious problem recently. We have a, quite a, an elderly population here, but a lot of tourists who are distracted, and they can't be constantly looking out for people travelling at 30 miles an hour on pavements, and that's happening mm. regularly at the moment in the city. Come at a certain time of day, like lunchtime, when our 500,000 people are having deliveries made, and you'll find there's a lot of people on bikes travelling on our pavements and taking shortcuts. It's really getting very dangerous on our pavements. That's not acceptable. Nobody ever confronts them. I've seen old ladies stopping them and trying to, trying to confront them. I've done it myself several times. It's not being addressed at all, as I can see. Uh, Sarah, again, I'm, I'm generally sorry that you are having that challenge and issue, and I would like to reiterate the commitment that you will have from our dedicated ward offices uh, with the resources that we have got available, uh, that we will be absolutely committed to working with yourselves on the ward base and, and, and you... Focus those resources at certain times of day and you'll start to address... So yes. can you just let the commander yeah. answer the question? Yeah, and, and I, I, I absolutely... Free 
appreciate your frustrations that you are experiencing in, re in relation to that problem. And what I'll do is that I will arrange a, through your dedicated ward meeting in your area, I'll speak to you, sir, after this meeting to ensure that you do get that engagement and, and that reassurance and also some understanding around the difficult choices that sometimes have to be made. But I absolutely take your frustrations on board and I will do my best to ensure that you get the right support and uh, updates that you require so that you have the perspective around what the offices are doing. Okay. Uh, Madam, uh, I know those ward, dedicated ward meetings have been taking place on a quarterly basis and it may be that they, uh, the, the details have not got through to yourselves. They are advertised on the websites, but I will also ensure that uh, if you'd let me know what your ward is and I can give you the dates and times for the next meeting. Very good. Thank you. Um, I believe you have a question here on the front row. Uh, first thing I would like, my name is Alina Kostepe. I'm from uh, Middlesex State. I'm deaf. Thank you for having interpreter for me. Uh, what I want to say for my community is from a state. Uh, I'm not happy because we don't have a big room for community. I'm telling you why the reason is I want everybody to understand because I know more about disability, all the people. I've been involved in so many projects and everything. Um, they got all the people, they got disabled people, and they gonna do like a box which is on the room for community on the podium, which is very small, four meter, six meter, is smaller than my live room, and they want the pe people on there, 24 people, no way can be in there. And I got people with wheelchair, walking stick and everything, they can't get inside the box. And I'm looking, please, you can help why, because if people with disability all they can't get in that box, that means it's been excluded. And I want to include my community, old and disabled, in my bigger room, and if you look out for this thing, please. And I can, we can try it, and I can show you exactly, I bring a wheelchair, I bring a walking stick, I will show you that all the people, they can't get all disabled inside. If you give big room, you make me happy. That's what I'm asking for. Yes, th th thank you very much. Um, uh, yes, I, un I understand this problem, and we have heard um, th this, re th this request. Um, the first thing I wanted to say, though, is in the work that's underway currently around developing um, the podium, you're quite right. There is a new community space that's being added into the podium, which is four metres by uh, six metres. It's not enormous, um, but given the size of the, the podium itself and the other things that residents themselves said they wanted to see included in, in the podium development, um, inevitably, there has to be a degree in the design phase, there has to be a degree of um, compromise and trying to meet as many of the needs as, uh, as possible or the requests as possible that have been put, uh, put to us. And in fact, um, at the steering group yesterday evening, we looked at the podium uh, design again um, and apart from perhaps some small tweaks, that design has been agreed uh, to be the final design, as I said, subject to one or two tweaks if necessary, uh, to be presented in the plans for the planning permission for the, the future. There have been, I think, three consultations, um, open consultations for all the residents to participate in that. We've taken account of as many views as possible, but you, as you can appreciate, not everybody wants exactly the same thing, so we've tried to incorporate as much as possible. So that, that, that's one part of the question. The second part of the question in um, an inside community room, um, I think, as, as you know, there are spaces on the estate and the artisan library, of course, is one where there is, a, there is community space. My understanding is that that's used um, quite well. If there are access problems or difficulties in, in using that space, then we'll certainly look at it and we'll certainly talk more about how that space can be used in, in the future. Um, the, there, are other, there are officers here who might be able to add more detail if necessary, but that my understanding is, is that's where we are. But very happy to talk more and very happy to try and see if there is scope uh, for doing more than we're currently planning. Are there any officers who'd like to uh, come to you in a second? Like to add to that? Will we get a bigger room? 
It's fine. It's fine if you don't have anyone to answer that. Um, I'm the treasurer of... Sorry. Um, I'm Jane Robinson, the treasurer of the Residents Association at Middlesex Street, and I sit on the um, committee that is chaired by, by Helen, um, who's doing sterling work. Um, and... Um, um, my understanding is that one of the complexities of the design as far as the room is concerned is that we can't encroach on the actual middle of the garden because that would actually place the new room above the police quarters and there would be security implications. And so we've had to come to some kind of compromise where we have a room which is actually... Um, um, which is actually in the garden but it doesn't actually position itself above the police because that would have actually led to prolonged discussions and negotiations that would have actually gone nowhere so we've actually done our best and we've got a very good compromise Yes, of course um, I, Well, I'll let Helen wrap up yeah, thank you. I guess the the other thing that it's worth uh, mentioning, as, pa as part of the work on Middlesex Street and the uh, Eastern Police Eastern Hub, we've also been able to identify an area which is going to be made available for a gym for residents-only use. So it's an additional facility that we haven't had in an internal space before, which I, I think, uh, again, many residents said that it was important to have that dedicated space. We've managed to include it into the... Into the into the plans, um, and the there have been questions about security, so we'll try to make sure that there is CCTV in the whole of the CTV planning at the entrance of there, so it could be absolutely clear who's going in and out. But it will just be for residents residents use. So there are a number of things, and as I said, please contact myself or contact the lead officer Paul Murta at any time if there are things that you think we've missed and should be included and incorporated in the discussions. We've tried really hard and thank you uh, very much Jane for the kind words. We've tried very hard to incorporate as, as many things as possible that residents have said are important. Thank, thanks Helen. Can I just ask the questioner oh, Yes, I was going to say, do you have a follow up? This is now about communities, about the police. Um, if you possible, what I see around um, a state and Liverpool Street and everywhere, the people who go for the park for drink is stolen a lot of bag around there. But the people, the panicking and can't get in touch with police or anything like that. Can you possibly put a warning uh, be, uh, about let them know is bag is stolen in this area? Mm. So put something that they can contact very easy police or anything like that. If he's writing a warning, that means they can when they drunk or tired they can see it and they're more aware about their bag. I think this will be very helpful and more less cases. Uh, Thank you for this question, Anna. We've spoken about this before at the uh, Eastern Base meetings. Um, Operation LUSCOM is the partnership response to the issue of um, uh, people either rough sleeping and begging and the antisocial behaviour, but also the vulnerability associated with some of those individuals. And what I can assure you is that we are working in a very sensitive way with all our partners, when I say partners, the corporation and other colleagues, to address the challenge and understand the vulnerabilities that sit behind those individuals and trying to find the right support mechanisms. Uh, I, I can assure you that it is not a simple solution or a, a, a challenge that can be addressed. Often there could be options of help and support off, offered to people and it's not always taken and, and hence therein lies the challenge. But we are working, I have again, through the Safer City Partnership, I've asked that to be prioritised under the ASB Working Group as one of the areas that we will give this focus on. I have also approved some funding for additional engagement in this area and to make sure that we can give the right pathways, right support to vulnerable and other individuals who seek to exploit uh, their, the vulnerability and people's kindness in this area. And if I just add for a quick 30 seconds, uh, if you go on our website, uh, City of London Police, under the Community Policing, you'll get the dates and times for all the forthcoming ward-based sector uh, meetings so that they're all listed. I've just checked now. Thank you, Commander. I mean, I would just add as a representative of an East London, uh, East City ward, Bishopsgate, we have a terrible problem with aggressive begging and we overlap with your ward. Um, and your question was actually partly about putting signs up, warning people, and so perhaps... Chairman or Chairman or Chairman, <laughs> that's something that we might be able to do. Sorry, uh, is there a, uh, sorry, can she add one more? 
Well, actually, I think we've had two questions, and I think we now need to move on if that's all right. The lady here, is it on the same kind of topic? More or less. Okay, please go ahead. And then, John, I'm going to come to you. Hi, my name is Juliana, and I live here in the Barbican. So, uh, as a small meditation company and uh, as a panelist of a grant giving project, I would like to know what is being done to create affordable space for a small business like mine and for cultural and community pop up projects. Um, I also run one autism group. Um, in the area that is for the community, and I could not find community spaces for it. Therefore, I'm actually running my city group in Islington, uh, <laughs> which is uh, not exactly what, uh, what we would like to do. So what can be done in terms of affordable space, pop-up spaces for community projects, and uh, uh, affordable, if not free, uh, spaces for community-engaging projects? Brilliant. Like the autism group. Very good question. And I, and I understand that the Resource Allocation Subcommittee recently approved funding for a new community space within the Barbican Library, which is within the centre, which would be, um, I think, co-administered with the Resident Association um, for community groups to use. So hopefully there will be something coming online soon. But I wonder, Shravan, if you want to maybe yeah. be, give a more forceful answer, because it's not my area of expertise. No, no absolutely. Um, I mean, I think this is, this is one of the things with new projects that we're passing on planning for is they've got to have some sort of community uplift they've got to be providing infrastructure for the local community and and this is something that you know i know the planning office has pushed very very hard now onto developers that, that they've got to be able to activate those ground floors we don't want fortress like buildings that no one can get into so they've got to be open to the community um we try and encourage them to have partnerships with charity organisations or, or you know, uh, organisations that provide uplift to the community like yours. Um, they've, it's up to the developers to really go out there and find those. Now, if you give your details, uh, we can definitely put them in touch. But, but th there's, there's almost a requirement now on the planning committee. We are very, very t uh, you know, honed in on this. We will be questioned, we do question developers very hard on how they're providing community benefit with their buildings. So it, it is very much in hand. Um, there are examples out there already. A good example is the Migration Museum, which is coming into Tower Ward. Uh, we bring them in from Lewisham. They, they're occupying a, a shell of an H&M in the shopping centre for years. And we've brought them into the Square Mile to have a bespoke space, which will have free entry, and the developers providing them rent-free space for a number of years. So there are good examples out there of where it works. Uh, and we're very happy to engage and do more of that. Thank you, Shivan. Are you completely satisfied with that response? No. I just would like to say, no, I, I will never be. <laughs> um, I would like to say that uh, I do teach in the Barbican Library, in the free space yeah. that is there. And I do my classes, uh, I, I teach for free when it is in the library. The space is not a good space for many projects. Any project that requires confidentiality, for example, yeah. that is not a good space. Well, so say, it's so community madam, what, spaces. What I was saying is we're building a new space in the Barbican Library, which will be soundproofed and hopefully more yeah, suitable. Yeah, I saw the life. project. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm there. Thank you very much. Um, but. It's very nice that it's good for charities, but there are lots of people that have cultural projects or pop-up projects, like the ones that we are fund that you are funding in the Imagine Fund, and that I'm part of the panel. And the feedback that we receive from this project is, thank you for the grant, thank you for approving my project. However, I cannot find affordable space inside of the square mile or inside of the city. Can I do my project in, in Sadak? Can I do my... So it becomes very difficult. How are we going to bring people to the city for the destination city if we don't have cultural and uh, um, educational and, and community projects here? It's a great question. And, and I would just add um, Barbican Renewal, which is the, you know, the renovation and the expansion and the improvement of the, the, the Barbican Arts Centre estate. We'll, we'll be looking at all of the internal spaces, which includes... Gosh, how many thousand, 100,000 square foot of unused space in the, in the exhibition halls, mm. which are just, for decades, empty space. It's astonishing. 
and as part of the renewal of those spaces, although there hasn't been any final design, and the work will have to go on, we have a fantastic architect-led design team looking at that, of course some of the ideas will include things like rehearsal space, community space, new theatre space, new artistic space, uh, as well as commercial space because the whole thing has to be self-funding. So Cherie, uh, you're, you're, not, not, you're not shaking your head, so I'm not saying anything wrong. So, I think, <laughs> but I, so my, my suggestion is if you connect up, we can make sure that the community needs are really plugged into the early thinking of Barbican Renewal because that's exactly the kind of thing that it should be looking at. Thank you. Now, John, I know I said that no elected member is going to be able to speak, but John is actually speaking on behalf of the chair of the Middlesex Street Leaseholders Association. I am indeed chair, but I'm a resident as well. Ah, but, and you're but, a resident. But, 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 I'm, but I've been asked to speak in my, in my position as councillor on behalf of uh, David Rose, who is the chair of the Leaseholders Association on Middlesex Street. Um, before I start, I'd like to say that these are not my words. These are his words. Um, I've shortened it slightly. It's to be quite long, but I've shortened it. But what I will say is many of the sentiments contained in here are shared by myself and my fellow ward members. So I'll start off. And it's about the Middlesex Street Estate again. The Middlesex Street Estate has lacked basic and necessary amenities and effective management for an unprecedented time with no published timetable or action plan for restoration of. Board games area, closed for three years. Guest flats, closed for three years. A safe young person's playground, currently plagued by electric shocks. Reliable lifts. One resident has been trapped twice in the last week. A secure, a secure entrance to the basement car park. A working intercom for the ground floor car park. An open and welcoming estate office, instead of one saying no unauthorised admittance. A proper entrance to Petticoat Tower, left unfinished, despite planning permission having been granted in 2014. A solution to leaks from public realm gardens into the ground floor car park. A fire alarm system that does not constantly return false alarms. Reliable CCTV coverage and monitoring instead of broken or low definition cameras. Proper and clean decorations, including removing and restoring damage left by the city's own contractors. A viable ramp access used by old and young alike to enter the sunken communal garden. Outdoor lights, which switch off during the daytime. Automatic doors for those with disabilities or mobility issues, despite long-standing written promises that they would be provided. And lastly, timely and informed responses to inquiries. So the question. The above list refers to one housing estate, but similar concerns are seen and experienced across other city estates. And, and this is in his opinion, and in my opinion, in, sorry, in David Rose's opinion, it reflects shame on the city and the Court of Common Council <coughs> that such issues are left to fester for months and years. When will you, and this is to the panel, when will you take steps to address the city's culture of neglect towards its residents and lack of investment in its housing stock? Mr Hayward. Thank you very much. And John, you did me the favour of warning me that you were going to ask this uh, question, albeit somewhat late in the day today. And I, I did say to you uh, by reply today that it concerns me a lot. That's a catalogue of concerns, if I can describe it that way, from one estate. And I wouldn't want to think that that was the general view, although I hear the applause for some of the points you make uh, from across the corporation. Um, when we talk about neglect, uh, neglect and investment in our housing estates, in general terms, general terms, I accept there has been an underinvestment in our estates over not just 10 years, probably 20 years. In my opening remarks to you this evening, I gave you some examples of some of the things we're starting to do. I accept only starting to do to address some of that neglect and investing substantial sums of money. I talked about 95 million in total that we will do. Uh, and the first project has been, which has waited for years and years and years, the Golden Lane windows, as I, as I mentioned. 
You raise in that question so many very, very specific concerns that I said to you this afternoon, I think it's only fair, that I should take it away and take it to officers and get an individual response on each of those points that you have raised. We will do that for David Rose, I absolutely assure you this evening. But you will understand that there's a lot of, an awful lot of stuff in there which gives me great concern as policy chairman and I will make sure you get, and David Rose gets, a detailed response to that. Thank you. And I'd like to turn to the chair of finance, um, who's only, what, how long into the job? Um, to the Chancellor. Um, you will have a perspective on this, I suspect. No, thank you. Yes. Um, I've just, just just starting to serve my second term as Chairman of Finance. I made it very clear when we last met uh, two months ago that I had four very key priorities for um, our, our financing strategy um, for the foreseeable future, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I've made it very clear to all members, be under no illusions about the challenges that, we, that we're facing across the board. We all know about the dangers of inflation. We know about the dangers of construction inflation. But actually, the one issue here, uh, historic underinvestment in repairs and maintenance, I, I have made one of my four priorities. We can't, I'm certainly not prepared to let it sit any further. We have to face it and face up to it. It has a very clear and very material financial connotation, which we're going to have to work out how, how to address. But I, um, I think I got un universal support for the Finance Committee. We have to grip this in terms of funding. It's not going to be easy to address that funding. Um, we're already projecting that the city fund, which is our local authority fund, is going to run into deficit in two years' time, should not be in that state. And really, our only three areas that we can raise are either council tax or business rates premium, or to get a further arrangement from central government. All of those are not easy. Uh, we, we have, as you know, increased council tax and business rate premium um, for the current year. The latter is largely for, um, for the police and security. Um, but all I can say is that it, it is absolutely up there. Uh, I, I can't answer on, on, on the specifics. Uh, I, I want to make sure that certainly if I'm allowed to serve my time, uh, uh, full time, that uh, I would like to have hit this on the head, certainly in terms of how we address it. It's not going to be a one-year um, answer. It's going to, I, I think, It'll be something for certainly for my successes. I have to take it on, but it, it, but but it, but I think if we can at least have come up with a formula and a way of dealing with it, um, then it won't be a problem. Uh, I, personally, I feel that the underinvestment really is. You know, if we let it carry on, it's a breach of trust for our successors, and and uh, and we have to deal with it. So I don't know if that answers your question, not specifically, but it, it's very much there. Thank you. Do you want to follow up, John? Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Henry. Now, are there any questions on the same topic? Uh, the lady up there has been waving frantically for some time. So, and Francis, I'll come to you to the snack afterwards. So, Brian and Catherine Colvin, uh, uh, Can you wait for the microphone? Sorry. Sorry. Brian and Catherine Colvin, Farringdon William. We live in Ludgate Hill, the ceremonial route to St Paul's Cathedral. Mm -hmm. And since COVID, this has become something of a commercial desert. Now, that perhaps is very sad. It is very sad. But uh, the properties around there that were commercial properties are being increasingly affected by... Uh, by uh, uh, graffiti and by uh, fly posting, uh, and the more graffiti and fly, fly posting we have, the We're more ready. the ceremonial look, road looks very poor. We've repeatedly asked the corporation to do something about it. Uh, I do think that if it was possible to clean and to identify the empty properties and make it clear that they shouldn't have fly posting and clear them away immediately they appear, we'd have a much better look to Ludgate Hill, which I think is important for all of us. Thank you. I I think that's a brilliant way of, of segueing from one topic to another. And I'd like, um, Mary, perhaps you could answer that, because I think as Chair of Environmental Services, you might have a view, on, unless you didn't perhaps catch the question. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, I'm, I am Chair of Port Health and Environmental Services. Um, I think we are aware, I mean, and, and part of Ludgate Hill is in my ward as well, uh, Castle Baynard. So we are aware of the, the increase in graffiti. Um, I wish people would report graffiti to the corporation as soon as it possibly happens. It doesn't because, make any difference. Well, well I, I know in the Barbican, where I live, it does make a difference. We do get it removed pretty, pretty promptly. And I don't, I don't know why that shouldn't apply in other areas as well. Please, please let me know if there is graffiti and I will take it up. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Mary. On the same topic, uh, Francis. Oh, you have to wait for the microphone, which will be coming your way from above. 
I think there was a Banksy piece of graffiti, actually, which people were campaigning to remove at that point, if I remember. Yeah, that's right. Francis Pugh, Barbican resident and City of London guide. Um, actually, this is segueing back. <laughs> um, uh, a piece of city property which I think um, has been severely neglected um, and is still in a parlous state is the um, Golden Lane Leisure Centre. And it's become um, embarrassing actually, to those people who were regular users and have simply given up uh, because of its lack of cleanliness, the poor management. Um, and ironically, this is just at the point when the local GP practice has started referring people um, for health reasons uh, to, uh, to, take, to, take, uh, to go to the leisure centre for... Uh, all kinds of uh, health-giving recreational activities. And I'm afraid I myself have long since given up and now go over the borough boundary to Ironmonger Row. Chris. Thank you. Fr Francis, let me give you a, a relatively high-level answer, um, but one I think which is important to give. And then, Helen, I think it's probably to you uh, and CCS, because certainly since the last residence meeting we had, uh, CCS, I believe, took the decision to extend Fusion's contract for 12 months with an option to extend for a further 12 months. Now, Fusion's service has not been popular with residents. I know that who are very unhappy with the state of the gym and the other facilities, and you've explained that to us tonight, such as the tennis courts as well. Uh, but no other operator, frankly, was willing to take on the space, which is a real challenge for us, I'm told. Now, we've just approved, frankly, uh, last week at Policy and Resources, uh, the new sports strategy for the city and the corporation. And I think it's worth me just actually quoting you something from that strategy, because it specifically addresses your point. Policy Resources said, we will consider the role and future of our existing leisure centre at Golden Lane, as well as opportunities to partner with neighbouring boroughs to ensure access to leisure services can be maintained. We will also explore options to enhance existing sport and play areas across the square mile to ensure they meet adequate standards and local needs. Where this is not the case, we will look to work with partners on improving these facilities. Now, that is, uh, you might say back to me, motherhood and apple pie. Um, what I would say to you is it is a statement of intent that we need to improve our sports facilities dramatically, none more so than this particular area that you're actually yeah. talking about, but we do need to find an operator to do it. But Helen, who is Deputy Chairman of CCS, will probably be able to give more detail. Not too much detail, because we've only got five minutes left and we want more questions. Okay, I'll be, I'll be as brief as, brief as I can. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the question, and to assure you that Fusion Gym has been a real focus of attention from Community Children's Services for a little while now. We, um, we are aware of the difficulties there, that there's been visits there, and we are trying to assess the scale of the difficulty, be quite clear about what the city's responsibilities are in relation to the gym, and, the, and there's no doubt the city does have some responsibility um, for the fabric of, of, of the gym. Um, we are have we're having assessments done. We'll understand within a very short period of time what the scale of the changes or the improvements needed, what the costs of those will be, um, and we will at CCS make a decision. Uh, about how far and how much we should be investing in the gym. I do want to say, though, there is absolutely no plan to close Fusion Gym. I, I've heard that, be, that said a number of times by, uh, by residents, but we do, as Chris has read out in the sports strategy, we are clear that there's a place for Fusion mm. Gym for, for residents in this area. However, it has got to meet the standards. Mm. And if they were not in a place where it can meet the standards, then we either have to consider how much investment is appropriate in the context of the, um, the overarching uh, uh, sports strategy. But with, there are no plans to close. I just want to assure people of, of that point. Thank you, Helen. Now, there was a lady at the top right-hand corner. If you can just wait for the mic. Thank you. Oh, hello. Um, hi, my name is Shirley. I'm a city resident. Um, last week was National Carers Week. 
And this is for people, those of us that have caring responsibilities for a friend, family member or neighbour. And whilst I was at Parliament last week, I learned of the cross-department working that they're doing there. It, so I'm wondering, can the city have a cross-department working attitude for carers? Because we have issues such as disappearing disabled bays within the square mile, across the square mile, and the need for a care home. So for instance, if a resident is registered elsewhere um, in a different borough, they're at the bottom of the care home list and we have an aging population. That's my short version. Thank you. <laughs> Um, Shirley, thank you very much. And, and first of all, I want to say thank you for all of the work that you do uh, for carers in, in this city. You've been fantastic to support people. Um, um, and thank you very much for, for raising the question. I think it is, um, I think the suggestion that there's be something uh, across the city, but also across borough, because we've a lot to learn from other boroughs, and we've a lot to learn from yourself and other carers uh, to try and um, <clears throat> do more than we perhaps have been in the past. Now, we do have a, a member, as you know, Anne Corbett, who's carers lead, and I'd say Anne has, again, been doing a fantastic job in trying to work with carers, understand in more detail what the issues are, and to push uh, the corporation as, as hard as we, we dare, because people are very busy, we know, but to have a, care as, a, revision, a revised carer strategy that I think is now scheduled for September, community and children's services. Now, what would be great is if, in the production of that strategy, if you're not already involved and have sight of, of the early drafting of that, um, we know how to contact you, Shirley. I think it would be great if we could have more direct involvement from you in the development of that, so that we don't get something back to CCS that we say doesn't go far enough and isn't ambitious enough. We can do better than that. Thanks, Helen. Now we have time for one more question, hopefully on a different topic. Madam, I'll just wait for the mic, thanks. I'm Katie, Barbican resident. Um, I wonder if the city is aware that there is a serious rat problem. Um, rats are rampant, for example, in Thomas More Garden. And I first became aware of them um, because I almost fell into a hole. And, they, and then I started looking carefully and They've dug many, many holes, and I think they, there's probably a network of um, tunnels, and I mean, I worry that the garden might cave in. <laughs> um, but, well, I hope that, um, you know, this city can tackle this problem at source rather than um, um, firefighting. Mm. Mm. So before I go to the chair of Port Health and Environmental Services on the rat tunnel problem, I would just, I live on Brick Lane, I can tell you something, we have a problem with rats. My strong advice is if it's allowed to get a terrier, they're very good at catching them. But Mary, go ahead. I know, I know, I know. Maybe that should be allowed. Maybe we should change that now. Well, we don't allow dogs in the well, public, and so that, kill that, that, that's a, a, a no-go for the moment. Um, I didn't know about this problem. Um, ah. I'm very glad that the ladies raised Good. it with us, and certainly we'll be looking into it, and I'll get in touch with her. Thank you. So we have covered an amazing range of topics tonight, um, finishing on a high, actually, I think, with the, with the, with the subterranean rat tunnels. And, and I would just like to finish by thanking all of you in the audience who have come, all of you who work so hard uh, voluntarily for your various different community groups and you form part of our fantastic, rich tapestry of the city's community. I'd like to thank the officers who've put a lot of work into the event, the Barbican for hosting it. I'd like to thank our sign language experts, our BSA mm. down here, who've done an amazing job. I'd like to thank our, our security guards, our front of house, our back of house, Mark Gettleson at the back, who's kind of kind of chaperoned us all tonight and put up with me being annoying. And, and anyone else I've forgotten, thank you. This is a really important event. There's going to be another one at some point soon. Do come to that. Uh, and just thank you again. It's, oh, and finally, because this would be me abrogating my duty, the Barbican Centre has some wonderful content on at the moment. A, a Strange Loop is about to open up in the theatre, a wonderful musical from Broadway. The London Symphony Orchestra are playing tonight, Simon Rattle, Simon Rattle's final performance. The place is packed, it's full. Buy tickets, go and see shows, enjoy the space, and uh, spend money. Thank you very much. Thank you.